and in plant and environmental sciences. I also have the Coker Chair of Genetics. It's an adult chair that was created in the 1980s by the Coke, by the family that owned the po Coker Pedigree Seed Company in Hartsville, South Carolina. They were like the Rockefellers of the early 20th century in South Carolina. So it's a great honor to be in the position. They focused on linking research, education, agriculture, and economic development. And that's what we try to do with our program. So today, I'm going to talk about what's natural in the 21st century. How many people were here with Glenn Roberts' presentation? A lot of people. Okay, Glenn's sort of rock and roll guy. So actually, I wanted to put things in context before I started the presentation. So um, I have a friend that I work with, and Glenn works with. His name's David Shields, and David Shields is a historian. And recently, David Shields got an award called the Keeper of the Flame from the Southern Food Waste Legacy. So there's an article in there that's written by Hannah Raskin, who's the food editor of the uh, Charleston Post and Courier. She's well-recognized national awards. So I tried to put things in context. So I just found this, and I thought it was quite hilarious. So let me read it. Um, there's nothing dilettantish about Shields' pursuits. A decade ago, he teamed up with Glenn Roberts of Anson Mills to parlay a longstanding interest in American food culture into the restoration of southern crop systems that develop around the commodification of rice. Uh, they envision bringing back the Sea Island white corn, white flint corn, uh, Charleston whitefield cabbages, Siva red beans that nourish coastal rice fields and the people who formed them. Um, Glenn talked a little bit about the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation. It's a nonprofit group that started looking at conservation of uh, Carolina Gold rice, but now we focus on heirloom varieties of crops that are important to the southeastern United States. So you all saw Glenn. He's a real exciting, energetic presenter and quite different from me. So here's the contrast. The Carolina Gold Rice Foundation now resembles a kind of Justice League of the countryside, with Roberts as the pitch man, Kresovich as the scientist, Brian Ward as the grower, and David Shields as a historian, albeit one who happily wanders into the freshly plowed fields. So Glenn made a really great presentation, and we work really well together, but we see things very differently. Glenn's a Renaissance guy, and he's very eclectic. He knows history, knows science. He greatly undervalues everything he knows, and he knows a million things. My approach is more scientific, maybe more reductionist, maybe more question-oriented based on biology. So, for example, one of the things that Glenn and I frequently bump heads on is, like, how do you get student involvement in these kind of things? So being in genetics and biochemistry and plant and environmental sciences, when I'm looking for a graduate student, the idea of just restoring a crop in a particular cropping system isn't a thesis project. That's something that we do based on the knowledge that we have, but it's not a thesis project. The kind of things that we do in genetics and biochemistry are try to understand how to improve Carolina gold, or can we improve Carolina gold, or what biochemical or nutritional characteristics did it have to make it so attractive? How does it fit in? So where Glenn and I work together is he's a big picture guy, Shields is the historian, sleuthing person, and Brian Ward does a lot of the seed increases down at the Clemson Station. So I'll try to talk to you quickly. It's probably, I have a number of slides that are going to probably uh, make your eyes glaze over, but um, you have to understand some of the signs. And you can't be sustainable without talking about seeds and genetics. And science is really progressing quickly. And there's a lot of things that are going on that you either need to know something about and or have a position about, it's going to happen whether you like it or not. Okay, so a, a good outcome of this is like you're energized, you want to do sustainability, and this is how you want to approach it. 
the downside of it, it, this could be a scary presentation because the world's really changing. There are things that we can do scientifically that may be perceived as good or bad, and whether I do them or not is really irrelevant. There are going to be other people that do them. Okay, so this is what I focus on. I see myself as Noah in the 21st century. I worked in uh, gene banks, national gene banks around the country. And basically, we're responsible for conserving genetic resources of crop plants. So Noah worked with animals. I worked with plants. Noah didn't have computers. Noah didn't have genetics. Uh, Noah had connections. You know, I don't have connections. And I know what the federal budget was for the repository that I worked in. I don't know what the, you know, the budget of Noah's Ark actually is and whether he overran the budget or not. But this is what we try to do is build genetic and genomic resources that people can either use in crop improvement or ask questions in biology and solve those questions. So we focus on characterizing diversity. What is diversity? I mean, if I'm supposed to conserve diversity, what is diversity? In this room, what if we had to recreate society after the Holocaust and we needed 10 people to move on to, like, repopulate the world? How do you do it? Obviously, you don't take all men or all women and humans, right? Plants, you get away with certain things like that. But those are the kind of questions we try to resolve. It's like collections aren't infinitely large or going to be infinitely large. They're constrained by finances to do this kind of work and the perceived importance of this work. And it's, it's an insurance policy of the future. So we focus on characterizing, conserving, and utilizing diversity. And underlying all that is what's the definition of diversity? How people look different? This gets back to the next question or a little bit of what I do. This is a plant that I work with. This is sorghum. It's native to the Horn of Africa, drought tolerant, non-transgenic cereal that's very important and gaining importance with climate change. This is a wild relative. This is an intermediate form, and this is cultivated type. So one question as a geneticist I ask is, like, how many gene changes did it take to go from this type to this type? Did it take one gene, 100 genes, 1,000 genes? So, like, you're at Clemson. Like rule of thumb things, you should know how many genes you have as a human. Do you know how many genes you have? You have about 20,000. You should know that. Because actually, you have a bunch of genes that are really good. You have a bunch of genes that are probably not so good, and you have predisposition for diseases. So how many genes in a sorghum plant? Strangely enough, there's about the same as in a human, about 20,000. So the question is, how many are important that plant breeders or the original people that domesticated the crop, who are women? If you go around the world, the majority of the farmers around the world are women. They're not men. And they're not using mechanization. So how many genes did it take? A lot of genes are little. And this has been an argument in evolutionary biology in the 20th century. And it turns out, in this case, a small number of genes allows you to make this complete change. And that makes it good for plant breeding. Because if it was thousands of genes, that would be cumbersome and slow and difficult. OK. A thing that uh, Glenn and David Shields and people with the Carolina Gold Rice Foundation highlight frequently is sort of the intersection between culture and agriculture. And what we'll talk later about in this presentation is the intersection between science and culture and, and agriculture. So each of these crops has an associated collection around the United States. So for example, the, Geneva, the apple collection is at Geneva, New York. The maize collection is at Ames, Iowa. 
um, uh, wine grapes are Davis, California. Uh, what else? But there's about 20 labs around the country. Pears actually at Corvallis, Oregon. So there's a network of gene banks around the country that maintain the diversity. There's also national and international gene banks. So there's an increasing emphasis in effective conservation and ultimately use of the genetic resources. So what do we see as the value of crop agriculture and diversity? So as we move into the 21st century, it's not really just food. There's issues related to medicine, nutrition that are really important. So this just highlights the breadth of crop species that could be used and the interesting compounds that could be obtained from plants. Plants have an incredible ability to produce secondary compounds that are really valuable in medicine. A lot of the pharmaceuticals are still plant-based, uh, plant-derived type things. So again, diversity within the species and diversity among all the different species leads to this capability for improving nutrition, human health, the environment, okay? Okay, so that's good stuff. So what's the bad stuff that's going on? Let's flip to this, okay? You're the sustainability guys. How many people have eaten genetically modified food in here? Okay. Has anybody not eaten genetically modified food? God, that's great. You guys get it. So everything you, if you've had any processed food, you've eaten genetically modified food. Just about all soybean, all corn, all cotton. We talked about it before the class started, half sugar. Anything that's sugar be derived is transgenic. And it's just a commonality. So there's a concern. So are the, you're the sustainability guys. Are you concerned about this? Here's the next slide. Uh, I travel internationally, and the only thing scarier than Darth Vader from Star Wars movies is something that comes from the lab of Monsanto. Monsanto's like, when you say Monsanto in the third world, it's like the evil empire. So what is it about Monsanto that alienates people? They do really interesting science. They're mercenary as hell. What do we not like about Monsanto? Go. That documentary, like so much else. I don't, I'm not that well versed in Monsanto. What was it, Food Inc.? Mm -hmm. I just put the word in the lexicon. Yeah. And in turn, believe my own family, you know, decided that uh, Monsanto was evil based yeah. on one documentary. And the general, I think, political discourse in the 21st century is that all corporations are evil. So I don't, I don't know what science they do or don't do. Yeah. I know they're mercenary with their pricing, but right, that's a really good point. They are mercenary. Yeah. Well, from my perspective, it's um, has to do with their buying up um, seed patents. Number one. Yeah, the industry is consolidating and consolidating. Right. So limiting diversity, and then also. Um, their contractual interactions with farmers. Yeah. They're, they're yeah, they sue farmers yeah. for collecting yeah. seeds and regrowing them. Go ahead. So I spent a lot of time as a kid in Guatemala, and like they're, they like straight up, like in the 90s, they would burn, like they would poison people's groundwater and, you know, burn people's crops and then come in off of I think there's a lot of misuse of chemicals. There's, well, no, they would like insist yeah. for itself to come and be like, we'll give you a cheap yeah. and then monopolize yeah. the lawyer. Like, like a drug dealer. Yeah. Okay. So there's multiple reasons to be concerned about Monsanto. I mean, first of all, it, you can be concerned about the products. But I think the bigger issue in the long term is corporate control of the food system. You know, there's consolidation, consolidation. Even now, somebody's actually trying to buy. Monsanto. There. Well, there's going to be plenty of hearings on that. So they don't own it yet. Actually, the other big seed companies are Dow and DuPont slash Pioneer. They're 
purportedly merging. So, like, but that's not uncommon. At the turn of the 20th century, there were probably more than 100 automobile manufacturers in the United States. And how many do we have now? So consolidation is a part of, I don't know, the perceived free market system. But I think it's really important that people discriminate what what concerns they have. To me, it's corporate control of the food system, it's heavy handedness working with growers and producers, it's limited products. Um they sell it's all part of the ethics, isn't it? Yeah. But you know you can do great things with GMOs and help a lot of people. Well, that's a good point. And you can also hurt a lot of people. Well, they're starting to do things overseas, which, I mean, they're doing work on transgenics in uh, cassava. And there's no money to be made in cassava. And there's a disease in cassava called cassava mosaic virus. It's spread by uh, white fly. There's no known source of resistance in, the, in, uh, in any of the gene banks. They've screened all the gene banks for all the cassava entries that they have in. But they actually can do a coprotein transformation, which is a simple process, and make cassava that are resistant to this cassava mosaic virus. And they're working on that. The other one that you probably have heard about is golden rice. And golden rice still isn't, isn't uh, used commercially. It's still under study globally. So, but this is, this is the science that's going on. And, I don't know what Monsanto does all the time, and you surely don't, but those are the kind of things we need to be concerned about. The other things that we need to be concerned about are uh, the changing science. We talked a little bit about this. The law that you're looking for is Moore's Law. So Moore's Law was done by Gordon Moore, who was one of the founders of, uh, I don't know which one, Yule Packard, I think, or one of the big companies like that. His argument was that power of computing doubled and price per unit decreased by half every so often. So this is Moore's Law. You did Moore's Law. This is one of the successful federal programs. People talk about federal programs not being successful and a waste of money. Uh, there was a lot of money invested in being able to sequence, not just humans, but plants, animals, whatever. This is the cost of sequencing. So in 2001, it cost more than $100 million to sequence one individual's genome. Now the price is less than $10,000. And it's probably going to go down even more in the next couple of years with new platforms. And then just to get another perspective on that, it's the cost of sequencing per unit of A, C's, G's, and T's, the building blocks of DNA. So here's that. So at one point, to get a million A, C's, G's, and T's determined, it costs about $10,000 per million um, base pairs. The price now to get a million base pairs is probably a couple pennies. OK. Patenting, is that? Well, this is the right time, or is that part of the discussion as well? Part of the discussion? It's not, patenting isn't an issue here. A lot of the money's through the federal government. So there's patenting and there's intellectual property, but there's ready access to it. They only patent their technologies. I don't want their tech, I don't want to buy their instrument. I just want to give them DNA and I want them to give me the correct information at the lowest possible price as quick as I can get it. I'm completely ignorant of this. That's why I'm asking, is, is a genome patentable? Ah, uh, genomes aren't patentable, but genes are. Genes are. Yeah, in the 1980s. Uh, so well, I was, a plant could be owned by an individual or... Not, uh, not, well, under the Convention on Biodiversity, which was passed in 1992, plants are like oil or gold. They're the property of a sovereign nation. So actually, in the old days when the Portuguese or the English moved crop X to a different environment or a different province or whatever, they did it. You can't do that now. It's called biopiracy if you do it now. 
and actually there are rules and regulations that are in place now internationally that are attempt to preclude that problem. So um, there are patents. The question is, if like you have a sorghum plant there, and I wanted to get that sorghum plant for you, from you, you're the Secretary of Agriculture in Brazil, and I wanted that plant. I'm a company, or and I'm an investigator in the United States. How do you put a value in that? Did, did the Brazilian government invest a bunch in? Well, you own, you own it. Actually, you own it, but that's a challenge in the country. The country has no mechanisms. The people in villages domesticated their crops. It wasn't right. the Brazilian government. But if it, if it came out of a Monsanto lab, and it's like a drought resistant, more drought resistant. Well, a gene resistant. for drought resistance. Right. They, could, they can patent it, a gene. But now, if I wanted to collect a drought resistant sorghum plant from you in Brazil, the question is, how do you put a value on that? Is it worth a million dollars? Or of the last that they developed over 500 years. And yeah. Just general breeding. Um, That's the big problem, right. Do they try and stop the exports? Of yeah. So there are countries like China where you can't get any rice or soybean these days. They won't let materials out. I think we briefly talked about this last week, Ethiopia. You can't take coffee out of Ethiopia. Coffee's moved all over the world. Expensive prices with Starbucks. The people that domesticated coffee in Ethiopia, they don't get a dime. That's an example of historic biopiracy that went on. Rubber. Rubber's native to Brazil, but the big production areas were like Southern Asia, like Malaysia and places like that. So. Again, ownership's real critical to the things that we talk about. Okay, another thing besides capabilities to do sequencing, the next important thing is like high performance computing, and you don't really need to look at this slide. All you need to know is like faster, faster, smaller. So we have the capabilities to manage big data sets now, and we can ask questions that we couldn't ask. It's like, if you wanted to walk from here to Houston, you probably wouldn't do it. But now there are airplanes, so you get on a plane and you go to Houston. The same thing happens in science. Some questions couldn't be asked or couldn't be answered 10 or 15 years ago because the technology wasn't there. But the technology is there to do it. Okay, so that's the background. So I'm going to present two case studies for you on how you discover natural genes, okay? Okay, so let's start on that. Um, genetic diversity plays an important role. It's like chromosomes, DNA, genes, messages, you make proteins, and it relates to some characteristics, so plant characteristics, whatever trait you name, it has a genetic basis. So we'll work through this. The first one I'll talk about is utilizing natural diversity to identify the genetic basis underlying grain traits in sorghum. So our goal is food quality sorghum. So much of the world, sorghum is used as an animal feed. However, in places like sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly semi-arid or arid areas, they eat sorghum all the time. And what we're trying to do is enhance the nutritional quality of the grain so that if you're forced to eat sorghum three times a day, there's some nutritional quality, and it's just not carbohydrates and energy, but there's other factors there that would um, improve your health situation. Okay. Okay, some examples. Here's the project goal. Facilitate grain yield and quality improvement by understanding the genetic basis. Uh, among qualitative traits. So, number one, we try to characterize natural diversity. It goes back to this thing we talked about. What is a diversity? Identify regions of the genome that are associated with these green, uh, with these grain traits, and then understand variants that are associated 
with desirable genes that give you the trait that you want. Okay? So basically, the kind of thing we do in genetics is like cartography. We make maps of crop plants. And our maps need to be high resolution maps. So I don't want a map that can get me to the United States or South Carolina. I want to be able to get to my house on Main Street in Greenville, South Carolina. That's the kind of resolution that we need to understand the genetic basis of different variants of genes. So basically, a gene could have one or two variants. It could have as many as 50 or 100 variants. It depends what the gene is, okay? And then identifying these genomic regions, basically what we're doing is making a map of the sorghum crop and understanding where on that map, and sorghum has 10 chromosomes, 10 pairs of chromosomes, where on that map is the gene that's associated with a particular trait. They do that in human genetics now. They do that in microbial genetics. They do it in every genetic system. That's In humans, the big push is looking for genes that are defective, that might be associated or that would allow you to have a predisposition to a particular disease. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the session, okay? So for grain quality, what's good grain quality and what's bad quality? You know, this is white, high starch. It's probably good for energy types. Why are these colored? They produce antioxidants. They're anti-nutritional compounds that um, preclude bird damage. The sorghum plant, if you see back here, look how easy this is. If you were a bird, you just fly in and you land on your lunch and start to eat it. It's not like corn where it's in a, in a husk. It's like there. So there's a lot of work to do breeding and selection for anti-quality components that it, they could cook out. But if you ate the grain raw, it would either taste bad or it would cause some uh, ill effect if you do that. So we look at all these different types of materials. And, uh, and this just gives you an example. You don't need to read uh, sort of the structure of the diversity that we use. But here's an example of two of the grain heads to highlight the diversity. OK? Now, this is a, um, a table that highlights two years, 2013 and 2014. And what I want you to do here is just to pay attention to the traits. This is the trait column, and I'll go over some of the traits. And these are the ranges of those traits, minimum and maximum for that year, minimum and maximum. So we look at 10,000 or 15,000 different lines. And GNP stands for grain number per panicle. That, this is the panicle. And this is how many grains. We count those grains. Because more grains, potentially higher yield. So look at the range that you could get when we looked at the 10,000. So minimum of 63 grain per panicle to as many as 4,000. The next trait is 1,000 grain weight. Higher number is better. That relates to bigger grain. So for 1,000 grain weight, this has 5 grams versus as many as 40 grams for 1,000 grain weight. And what we're trying to do in this slide is, what I'm trying to do is just highlight the ex extensive range the amount of starch per seed, 55 to 75. Amylose, this is um, digestible energy, DE. This number of calories per gram of grain. So there's significant variation in all crop plants that are grossly underexploited and aren't knowledgeable or aren't being utilized in conventional breeding right now. And that's what we tend to do with the genomic tools that we're developing. Um, 
We talked about the genome, the genome being a certain size, developing a map. So here's what we do. We develop a map for all the 10 chromosomes. And this highlights actually um, chromosome one. And this, this is how big it is. And these are physical locations on that chromosome. So one end is zero, and then at the other end it could be 10 million base pairs. So we have markers at all those locations. And what we're trying to do is to find places on the map that are associated with particular traits. So here we have a statistical analysis, and that's a measurement of statistical <laughs> fire. We're able to find potentially a region of the map that are associated with 1,000 grain weight. This is pretty standard. The only hard thing here is not the models or how you analyze it. It's just to have the computing power because for each individual, in an experiment that we set up, we might do an experiment that involves 10,000 individuals. And for each of those individuals, for their genome, we could have as many as four or 500,000 markers. So you do the factorial, 10,000 by four or 500,000. We're usually simultaneously measuring 30 to 50 traits in multiple environments over multiple years. So that's like terabytes of data. That's like not easily managed by like a desktop computer. And that's just one experiment. That's not like the range of everybody. That's like one experiment for one undergrad or one graduate student. That's a lot of work and it takes a lot of computational power. So here we are where we've identified a region. And the region of that, uh, of that, uh, association with 1,000 grain weight is so small that in that region, genes aren't like, like um, they're not pearls on a necklace. They don't like line up here. The genome is like the necklace is from this end of the table to that end of the table and there's a gene here and there's a gene here and then there might be 10 genes here and 20 genes here and a single gene here. It's like actually an oasis in the desert. So in this instance, we found a bin that's associated with a gene, and it was easy to find a gene that was there, and the gene is called RCD1. It's called radical-induced cell death. So big deal. Okay. This part of the work that we do is called comparative genomics. Evolutionarily closely related crops have similar genetic makeups and similar genetic functions. So in other crops, other than the sorghum crop that we're working, RCD1 has particular effects. Here's the rabbit opsis, here's barley, here's rice. But it's consistent with what we're looking for. And ultimately what we needed to do is to set up a model. You can't just discover a gene but before you validate it, you have to be able to understand how the gene affects other things. So actually what you see is RCD is expressed in the endosperm, the starchy part of the grain, and it's been shown to interact with a wide variety of factors. And it allows the seeds to be either shrunken or larger. So the RCD gene one is a gene that we're looking at. And we're looking at variants of that gene to see which variants of that gene confer high, high grain weight or high seed weight, bigger seeds. And that's, that's sort of grinding through uh, how we look at natural variation, okay? So it's slow, it's cumbersome. I see people ready to go to sleep and, I mean, that's how it goes. It's a grinding, grinding process. It's not like Eureka, I discovered it. But now let's talk about other ways of natural diversity. And this is something that is a take home message for you. So is anything that we did in our study that I just showed you 
threaten you. It's like sort of bookkeeping, working, measuring, counting, doing genetic analyses, you know. Nothing threatening there. Okay, so let's let's talk about some more signs as we go ahead. Um, I need to make sure where we are. We're good. Cool. Okay. Um, there's stuff happening. And this is an example of what we're interested in as well. Our lab focuses on genetics and biochemistry. This highlights something called a brown midrib gene. Do you know what the midrib is, you plant guys? It's like that central conducting portion, portion of a leaf. You can see it frequently either green or brown. And when it's brown, it tends to be lower in lignin. And lower in lignin is good for if you're trying to convert it into a biofuel or you're trying to feed it to an animal. Animals don't process lignin. They process cellulose and to a certain extent hemicellulose. So for feeding characteristics, brown midrib mutant may be attractive. Okay, so that's an example of, we call this the trait or the phenotype, brown midrib. Okay, so how did they get this to become this, okay? So they did some mutation work. This was done in the 70s, and I think they used like, I don't know, chemical mutagens. So basically, they got a single change of a nucleotide right up here, okay? So instead of C, it became a T. So where there's no asterisk means it's not consistent. Everywhere else it's consistent. Well, what did that change there do? It caused the gene to be truncated. That means it became non-functional. It didn't produce. A gene is like thousands of base pairs long. It could be 10,000 base pairs long. It could be 1,000 base pairs. The difference between that brown midrib and the green midrib is the brown midrib is a truncated gene, and it, it doesn't produce the lignin because it's defective in that particular gene. Okay? Okay. Okay. So this is this is the take home message for natural diversity. So how many people know what genome editing is? How many people have ever heard of genome editing? Okay. So genome editing is gonna like the, whoever discovered genome editing, and there's probably multiple people that are so they're going to get the Nobel Prize. Like, I don't know when it's going to come. They're getting the Nobel Prize. So genome editing is a technique that you guys are going to tell me, is this transgenic or natural, or is it not natural or transgenic? You guys will be the judges. So basically, it's a sort of a two-fold system that I want to affect lignin. So I sequence the lignin gene because I could do it, okay? So we use that top sequence. So that's WT stands for wild type. That's the green. So we know what all those genes are, okay? By knowing the 20 genes, the 20 base pairs, that start that gene, you can introduce this target sequence to uh, a microbial enzyme. And the enzyme has this ability, it recognizes the site that you put in there, and it goes in there and it cuts the gene, or cuts the DNA, creates a double-stranded cut. Precise exactly where you want it. And it's all based on you giving it the directions to go in there. This is what you need to know. Okay? Okay. So here's the uh, protein going in. Here's the target, the 20 uh, nucleotides. And this is what you can do. You create the, here's the original wild type characterization. 
You can either insert something, you could cut something out, or you can move the DNA in a particular way that makes the gene be knocked out. That's what the frame shift's called. Also, this, these uh, enzymes come out. So basically, you're changing that gene, and if you do it right, there's no freaking evidence of it being a transgene. You don't know if it's natural, or you don't know if they did it in Monsanto. Okay? No trace. No trace. No forensic evidence. Of no trace. Other plant genes, or what about if there's like some? Yeah, well, why? So, let me let me go back and tell you. There's human tests that are now proved. I don't know if you've been listening with this genome editing. That's why they're getting a Nobel Prize. They're doing it on sickle cell and cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a real horrific disease, and why it hasn't been worked on for. There's no solution to cystic fibrosis. It's the gene's about 5,000 building blocks. And then there are 500 different mutations that make that gene go bad. So that's not good. What you'd want uh, to being a, doing a therapy, you just want one mutation. You correct that. Now we have the capability, and we know the sequence of a healthy gene that's associated with cystic fibrosis, uh, if it's defective, and you go in and you edit it. So there's actually studies that are going on now, particularly in sickle cell and uh, cystic fibrosis, and I think there are a couple cancer initiatives that are started. You can't, you can't tell. The game's changed. Like with other transgenics, you could go in and say it's a microbial gene, or there are other marker genes that in the past people used to document that it's a transgenic. It could be like a herbicide resistance or canamycin resistance or something like that. This game's changed, man. It's like, if you know what you're doing in the lab. So, what's well, cooking? So these are crops, uh, and pick your favorite, and there's a bumper crop of genome additive plants for particular things. You can see what they were done for. Altered growth, yield, herbicide resistance, consumer benefits, disease. You don't know. If I were those companies, I'd be gene editing left and right like it was going out of business. And there's no way to track it. There's absolutely no way. Is this about CRISPR? Yep. Yeah, it's a CRISPR-Cas9. Yeah, that's exactly it. I'm sorry to go into more detail, but that's what it is. So if you look back here, you'll see CRISPR-Cas9. We do CRISPR-Cas9 in our lab. It's like non-brain surgery. Anybody could do it. So, so is, are these natural? Hmm. We are a part of nature, so technically, wait, wait. I don't know. You're the judge on that, not me. Do they reproduce with the exact same trait? Yeah. Okay. Well, it happens in nature all the time, doesn't it? What? It happens in nature all the time, doesn't it? Well, there's changes that occur in genes and can be selected for. You know, again, I'm not saying this is transgenic or non transgenic. You're the jury. This is the 21st century, and that's one of the points that I wanted to bring up. Maybe you don't care. When this class is over, you go your merry way and eat a Big Mac and or go get a vegan dinner or something like This is happening. This is happening. You need to be aware of it because it affects you. It either affects you or your family or your kids or, you know. If I understand you right, then the question is transcended completely. If we can't know, uh, it's still the ethical question, obviously, but if you can't know, no case could ever be... I don't know. That's why, that's why it's out of my presentation, what's natural diversity in the 21st century. Right. I mean, the way we do it the old way that you, your eyes were glassing over when we do thousands of markers and thousands of plants and we're measuring esoteric traits. That's like the old watchmaker. 
This is the new game. I think an interesting question is, does your body know? Like if you're, especially with like med plants that are grown for medicine or for food, what, maybe we don't know um, in a lab, but does your body know and is there different enzymes necessary? To make Makes the same thing. But it is your body though. It's, just, it's the same material. Yeah. There's no difference. There's absolutely no difference that they added all the crap out. All the fingerprints and all the things that you could get thrown into jail before. They're wearing latex gloves and molecularly wearing latex gloves and that's that's the outcome. What is the the previous slide mentioned a novel gene or trait is introduced? Where is that, where does that come from? What what template do you use? You could use a normal plant. So if like you were trying to edit a plant for a disease resistance or a new variety for disease resistance. If you found a crummy, crummy plant that showed the resistance to a particular disease, you'd sequence that gene, take the 20 nucleotide leader, throw it in and correct it. So what goes in is based on what people know is to be functional. I don't see the difference between that and introducing a, a trait from a, a different organism. Is it, are, you, are you just selecting traits? Well, this doesn't introduce alien DNA. Like in herbicide resistance, there's no plants that are herbicide resistant. That's a microbial characteristic or a mutation of a plant gene. And so, if you got it right, you, you introduce something for a desired trait, you might get something else that undesired. You well, you can, it. yeah, things can happen. Yeah. I mean, there's, the federal government's working over guidelines right now, but like you're all a voting age and you pay taxes and stuff like that. So this is the issue. It's like. So you just said that, that like, for instance, in um, the herbicide and glyphosate resistant plants that Monsanto. Yeah. That is not being known as that. No, that's transgenic. Transgenic. Okay. Yeah. But it's like, I don't, you know, people don't want transgenes. Well, this is, what is it? Yeah. That's editing. I don't necessarily have a problem with this, but I don't see the difference between this and inserting a foreign gene. You're still editing the genome regardless. It's still well, the outcome is similar, but what you're, so I think people, some people don't like transgenics because of the idea of moving genes from species that are not sexually compatible. Scientists create being God. In this one, you work within the gene pool and you know what the genes are mm -hmm. and you can do it. So. I mean, it, the outcomes may not be significantly different. The process is certainly different. The process is different. Uh, well, I think that's one of the arguments in uh, regulations genetically modified. Are you looking at outcomes or process? Yeah. Historically, they've looked at process, and that's where transgenes hit the wall. When you have, um, like, the resistant herbicide resistant plants so that I think they inhibit a, something called a sugar mate pathway in a, in a plant and yeah. they're able to kill the weeds so quickly. And then what they're, they're So let me ask, so you go to the sustainability, who works on the organic farm? Okay. So are these grown on the organic farm at Clemson or not? Um, no. they're growing. What? Probably. You'd probably grow? No, I certified organic. I, I feel like this I mean, probably doesn't meet that's that. It, that's it. That's the criteria. criteria. I mean, no. this kind of. Um, this I love this kind of debate. I mean, that's exactly what I'm trying to foster here. I don't think it's simple. So is, is genome editing considered genetic modification? I don't know. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's modification. Well, in organic production, it's zero tolerance for any kind of. That well, that's not true. That's not true. So, plant breeding has occurred for ten thousand years, and we modify. Um, but that's right. natural diversity. But this is natural diversity too. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, again, if I'm understanding right, you have to drill down on what's objectionable in the first place. 
So genetic modification is wrong for reason X, or not wrong for reason X. We've got a new process here that, that doesn't have necessarily the same outcome, maybe it's a similar process. What, what is objectionable? Exactly. I mean, that's, that, that's why I get lost as well. And that's so my bet, my bet would be you won't grow these on your organic farm. Well, we could. Why? Because it's prohibited in the NOP. It's not prohibited. You won't even know. If somebody came down and said, I got a grape that has, how would you know if it's transgenic? Well, how would you know if it's added or not? The tools that were used to move the genes, it's, it's, it's the process that was involved in one of our previous speakers. Explained well, that. What, what if the companies are doing it right now? Why do they have to show you documentation? They could say it's a natural variant that they found in Africa. That's a good point, but I think a lot of, a lot of plants are marketed for their transgenic factors. So that's actually something that they... So this is some kind of transparency and labeling. I think that a lot of plants are, are marketed, companies no, marketed for their food trade. Okay, question the other. Uh, this is not one. Uh, no, I know, yeah. but, and I'm not asking about ethics or process. Yeah. Would it, can yeah. the same process help bring back heirloom crops like yeah. Carolina Gold? Or chestnut. You go the other way. You can, yeah. you can or chestnut. reverse engineer something right. back into history. Yeah. But Provided that's where it was. Yeah, exactly. Whatever seed it was, it disappeared. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I understand, you know, being strategic, uh, avoiding negative PR. I, I, just, I think this is interesting. I think that we should harness this type of technology. Well, they are. Uh, but uh, I, uh, you take a position that many people take. But not everybody takes that position. But what about the effects? Like, I, I keep going back to this because it's, it's, it's a very real thing in present day. What about the effects of human health? So, as a scientist, you can't make you have to you can't make a moral determination on that, right? But what about who does make the moral determination? Science, science produces no moral determination. That's yeah. a philosophical question. But, but what then, they're going to be doing this to people. Forget human health. Where's Designer the, people. Of course. But where's the platform for someone to say, all right, so now we know we have shigamate path, our, our biome and our intestines also have a shigamate pathway, and the residues of glyphosate on our food is killing our... our Adjusting your microflora. Microflora yeah. and making us very sick of the society. Mm -hmm. So who's stepping in and saying, oh, no? Well, all I'm doing is saying to you as educated people is this is where the science is going. How it gets employed, how it gets questioned, how it gets deployed, that's like a societal, that's a societal yeah. thing. I mean, this can obviously be used for wonderful things. I, obviously, these products should be, um, I, I think that they should be thoroughly tested. I know that GMO products are they're, uh, subject to more trials and testing than any other product on the no. planet. And that's, that's Dr. Bellinger. He boarded uh, an article to the entire class. I'd be happy to share it. But so, so uh, we no, probably don't have to test. Like, 